for my generation in the mid 80s, when I was in my 20s, just starting to do politics in a serious way, it seemed like the only way to, to the only outlet for revolutionary desire was to go to Central America and to somehow participate in, or at least observe, their revolutions. I mean, so a lot of people went to Nicaragua. I, with my friends, was mostly interested in El Salvador. But the, um, the thing I realized at a certain point was that all we could do was really observe what their revolutions were. And the defining moment for me came in a meeting in El Salvador with the group of uh, students at the University of El Salvador. And at a certain point, a friend there said, look, we're really grateful for these North American comrades who come to help us, but it would be really, what would be really best for us is if you all would go home and make revolution in the US. That would really be better than trying to come help us here. And it was true, of course, I don't think any of these North Americans were particularly helpful in Nicaragua and El Salvador, et cetera. Um, and, but I said at that point, you know, Reagan's in the White House. I have no idea what it would mean to make revolution in the U.S. I just don't have any idea. And he said, look, don't you have mountains in the U.S.? And I said, yeah, we have mountains. He says, it's easy. You go to the mountains, you start an armed cell, you make revolution. And I thought, oh, shit, you know, uh, that it just didn't correspond to my reality. Like those notions of constructing the armed cell, especially constructing the armed cell in the mountains and then sabotaging things, it didn't, it didn't, didn't make any sense at all. So we really had no idea how to do it. Um, not just we didn't know practically, like we didn't know which rifles to take up into the mountains. It's that the whole idea of what it involved was lacking um, and required a, a real conceptual rethinking. We're stuck, conceptually, I think, between two almost cliche ways of thinking revolution today. On the one hand, we have the notion of revolution that involves the replacement of a ruling elite with another better, uh, in many ways, ruling elite. And that's, in fact, the, the, the form that many of the modern revolutions have taken and have posed great benefits for the people, etc. but they have not arrived at democracy. And so that notion of revolution is really discredited, and I think rightly so. But opposed to that is another notion of revolution, which I think is equally discredited from exactly the opposite point of view, which is it's the notion of revolution that in fact hasn't been instituted, that, that thinks of revolution as just the removal of all of those forms of authority, state power, the power of capital, um, that stop people from expressing their natural abilities to rule themselves. The question of human nature has long been a thing of political philosophy. In fact, I'm sure everyone had some stupid evening in college smoking too, way too much and talking where you end up a discussion where, like, you're, you decide you disagree with your friend because she thinks that human nature is evil, you think human nature is good, and you can't get any further. I mean, this is, I think that's, th that kind of stupidity, I think, has affected a lot of the history of political philosophy. And I think the relevant fact for politics running aground. <laughs> Shipwrecked. The relevant fact for politics is really that human nature is changeable. Human nature isn't good or evil. Human nature is uh, constituted. It's constituted by how we act, how we... The history... Is, how, human nature is, in fact, the history of habits and practices that are the result of of past struggles, of past hierarchies, of past victories and defeats. And so this is, I think, actually the key to rethinking revolution is to recognize that revolution is not just about a transformation for democracy. It's really, revolution is really requires a transformation of human nature 
so that people are capable of democracy. Democracy is one of those concepts that seems to me has been almost completely corrupted today. In some cases, it's used to mean simply periodic elections with a limited choice of rulers. In other cases, when one thinks especially in international affairs, it often means following the will of the United States. But really, democracy means the rule of all by all. It means everybody involved in collective self-rule. Oh, you see those turtles over there? How do you transform human nature so that people will be capable of democracy? Lenin's solution to this problem is a properly dialectical one. He thinks, and he, this is in large part with the Soviets enact, that there has to be a negation of democracy, call it dictatorship of the proletariat, some sort of hegemonic state that would then operate the transition, that would transform human nature, then to eventually arrive at the time when people are capable of democracy, the state's no longer uh, necessary, etc. It's probably the dialectical nature of this that seems to me mistaken. How do people learn democracy? How does human nature change to become capable of democracy? Not by its opposite. It can only be done in a sort of positive development by, you can only learn democracy by doing it. And so that that seems to me, the conception, the only way that seems to me today to be able to re rehabilitate the conception of revolution. Revolution then today refuses that dialectic between purgatory and paradise. It's rather instigating utopia every day. There's something quite, that feels immediately quite inappropriate about talking about revolution on such a, what would be sort of like aristocratic almost, I mean, not even bourgeois aristocratic location. You know, rowing on a beautiful pond in a park with the rich of New York all around it. It seems like kind of an absurdity. Well, where would we pick that would be the revolutionary spot? But then that would be cliche already. Here the cliche would be that you choose as a, as a visual site either, either a scene of poverty or a scene of labor and production. Um, because then you would show the ones who would benefit from it and the, even the subjects, you know, the actors that would, that would conduct it. But it's, it strikes me in another way that it might be appropriate to have, to work against such a conception of, of revolution as, um, as loss and as deprivation. It makes little sense to me to say, revolution can't be made in the United States, or revolution can't be made in Europe because everyone's too comfortable, because they have too much to lose, etc. They too have an enormous amount to gain. When we say a better world is possible, we don't just mean a better world for those who are least off today. We mean a better world for all of us.